everybody. Try again. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Everybody happy to be back, right? Uh, there is, uh, today is a special occasion. Um, everybody who has uh, completed or is in the last moments of completing their PAEs, can we see the PAE folks? Yeah, we should have a little pause for them to get there. What's a PAE? Who would like to explain what a PAE is? Come on. Yes, they're a torture. Uh, people who are second year in the Master of Public Policy program here at the Kennedy School submit the same public policy analysis exercise, which is basically a Kind of like a master's thesis. Yeah. And uh, is the object typically of a lot of anxiety uh, and effort, right? So it's good to have that. Um, done. Uh, the other thing, I was just curious, um, who was out of the country over the break? Who was out of the U.S.? Where? Where Where were you? Israel, Palestine. Yeah, Israel, Palestine. Ecuador. Ecuador. Uh, Israel as well. Yeah. Texas. Texas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is from a Ukrainian perspective. <laughs> 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 Where else? Where else? I'm just curious. Yeah. Turks and Caicos, sorry. Huh? Turks and Caicos. Oh, all right. Yeah. Where else? Me too. I, I was in the Caribbean to visit Turks and Caicos. Oh, tough, tough uh, place. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where else? Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Costa Rica. Costa Rica? Yeah. Oh, they did both. All right. Cool. Good. Any place else? Yeah. I was actually had an interesting, I was out in, uh, in Bogota. Uh, we were um, meeting with people from five countries about the Amazon. Uh, it was very interesting. There was actually an organizing workshop for like two and a half days with people from very diverse sectors from these five different countries trying to see if there were possible strategies people could come up with for collaboration around deforestation and all the sort of issues involved there. So and for me, it was a special treat because I got to work in Spanish for about three days, which I don't get to do much anymore. But which, uh, I don't know, I don't know, those, a lot of people here speak two languages. You find you shift personality. Yeah, I'm funnier in Spanish, but anyway, that's, that's like another, another story. So, <clears throat> here we are. Do we have any, any, uh, any uh, announcements or guests today? Guests? Announcements? Yes? No? I know we have one guest. Would you introduce yourself? My name is Shalom Bilan. I'm Israeli, former member of parliament. I'm here as a fellow. Okay. Okay. Any, any, anybody else? <coughs> any announcements? I guess, no, we're not cranked up yet for that. So, okay, that'll come. So we're at halfway. Um, we finished the, uh, uh, working through the five practices that are at the heart of the organizing framework, the relationship building, storytelling, strategizing, action, and the structuring uh, of it all. Uh, actually, somebody uh, was using that uh, bicycle down in, in Bogota as an example of our pedagogy. And somebody said, yeah, but it's missing the bicycle rider. Which is a good point. I hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that's actually a crucial role there. So, so uh, yeah, it lives and learn. And, uh, and, and from here forward, the focus is going to be integrating. Uh, the different practices, how they work together, uh, uh, both in your projects and in cases basically after today. Today's sort of the last of the sort of theoretical frameworks that we're going to work <coughs> with until, until the, the very end. So it's a good time for assessment, you know, for evaluation assessments and so forth. So uh, first some things about the papers and then some things about the evaluations. Um, on, on everybody should get them, have gotten them back or will get them back. Uh, we had, just in distribution, uh, there were 7% um, A's, 29% A minuses, 22% B pluses, 31% uh, B's, and 12% B minuses. So you can kind of look at yourself. Now, the, the meaning, what are the meaning of those grades? Well, uh, again, the intent of the midterm was to combine um, self-learning awareness, the conceptual understanding, and then the evidence from projects 
in an assessment, a set of claims, and then claims supported uh, by, uh, by evidence as to ways in which your projects might be working or might not be working. So th these grades don't reflect whether your project was working or not. They reflect the learning that's uh, communicated through the, through the paper. Uh, what the grades meant, um, an A is an excellent paper, an A minus is uh, a, a very good paper but has some issues, um, which we tried to identify. Uh, a B is a so-so paper, a B plus is a so-so paper with some pluses. Uh, very scientific. Uh, a B minus is barely passing, uh, C plus is not passing. Um, the um, things that seem to come through, uh, most critical, are the extent of self-awareness, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that, in terms of co one's consciousness of one's own um, learning process and relationship to those with whom one is working and learning. Uh, the extent to which the papers were analytic as opposed to descriptive. In other words, the intent of the paper was actually to analyze and draw conclusions and reflect critically, not just describe <coughs> what, what was going on. Uh, and then uh, clarity in terms of concepts and the extent to which they were supported. Um, we're posting four papers, um, uh, Lydia, Sue, uh, Mick, Powers, Arjun Suri, and Kate Aiken, uh, as examples of uh, people who pulled it off well, uh, and they'll be able to take a look at those. Um, I also want to explain what our grading, how our grading system works. Um, if your final paper is an improvement over this paper, in other words, let's say you got a B minus and then you get an A plus or well, whatever the journey. But if your final paper is an uh, improvement over this paper, then it will automatically move this grade up to whatever that grade is. Okay. If it if it's loud if it's not lousy no if it's not as good as this paper, then you keep this grade. In other words, you can't lose. You can't go backwards. You can only go forward. See how this works? Everybody clear about this? So any improvements on final papers will automatically move up midterm grades. Because the whole point here is learning. I mean, that, that is the whole point. And so hopefully um, that helps recognize that. Um, the last thing I want to say just in general is that, um, as we said from the beginning, there's really three kinds of learning going on here at least and how they interact. Uh, there's behavioral learning like, you know, how do I do a meeting agenda sort of thing. Uh, there's conceptual learning. and there, you know, what does it mean to have a constituency? What, what, how does strategy actually work? Um, what, what, what is a theory of change? Um, what's the difference between an outcome and what isn't an outcome? It's conceptual. Uh, but probably the most central form of learning in this class is the emotional learning. Um, and has to do with um, moving out of the position of being a dot, um, risking failure, uh, risking uh, rejection, uh, asking for commitments, putting your fate in other people's hands. Um, really think that's the heart of the matter in so much of this work. Uh, and it's so much of what goes on out in the world and what, what is involved in our own learning. And as I, I think I said before, it's very episodic. It tends to be very episodic rather than incremental. It tends to work in sort of thresholds and breakthroughs rather than just sort of like a straight line like that. So uh, that's some you know, observations based on our reading of your papers, and they'll be returned to you. Or should, how many people have got it back already? OK, good. No, that's, that's the idea. Now, um, on the other hand, at the same time, we asked you to um, give an assessment of how the class is going, the lecture as a whole, and also the, the sections. And we're going to post that online for you so you can see what everybody's picture is of how the class is going. And, ways in which it's working well and ways in which uh, it's challenged. Um, in terms of the overall, I have a few comments here, but then uh, we'll take some time in each section so you can look at um, your observations on your own section and where improvements can be made there as well, as well as things that are working well. In terms of pluses overall, and I guess a lot of that means, means what goes on in this room. Uh, engagement, passion, that we're kind of cool with that. Um, explaining concepts, uh, stories, drawing on experience. Uh, where we seem to need improvement is on use of readings, um, on the sort of uh, hiding the ball in discussion. In other words, 
where discussion is not really a discussion, where I'm just looking for an answer, and then I wait, you know, then I get it, and well, you know what I'm talking about. That's, and then I have an issue with accessibility, and that's very clear uh, through all that. So, um, you know, improvement areas seem to be how we can lift the quality of discussion, the classroom discussion especially, and the role of readings, which to some extent is going to happen fairly structurally as we shift what we're doing in, in the class moving, moving forward. Uh, in terms of sections, again, you'll go through there, again, engagement, um, familiarity with the, with the material, accessibility, caring, uh, seem to be uh, pretty consistent with our teaching fellows. Questions about discussion, about question, uh, is where, where there's more learning to be done and more development to be done. And you can go into that in more detail. So, um, in terms of where we are, uh, we've offered feedback on your papers. Um, be important to have a one-on-one -on -one check in with your TF, um, focusing on what, where the sort of learning threshold is now. Um, and then looking at the next six weeks in, in sort of like campaign plan two. Uh, and putting that off is not a good idea. Uh, doing it right now is a really good idea. So that you're going to be very strategic about how you use this part of the class. Uh, and, and like I said, the, the focus is going to shift to cases, projects, and integration uh, more than it has been up to this point. So let me just stop there for a second. Comments? Questions. I mean, that's, it's sort of an effort to try to focus on the fact that we're midway and, and this is a good time to assess, reassess, and so forth. Questions, comments? Any of the TFs want to add anything? Anybody? What's, it was like the conversation stopped. There was too much dancing out there beforehand. Before <laughs> finances, I didn't know. All right, well, look, I mean, we'll welcome, you know, conversation about this and, and in, the, in the sections as well. So, Really, no questions. Okay. From the, okay. I, I have a question. All right. Uh, I guess I I evaluated you as being very accessible. So <coughs> oh. why other students found Professor again unaccessible? Um, that was interesting. Office hours. It's office hours. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably what it is. I mean, I don't I don't think it's a personality judgment. I think it's more about hours. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> no, I think it's more about meeting time and being able to have one-on-one -on -one meetings, which I would love to have more of. Uh, but uh, uh, that's um, yeah, that's a sort of constraint that I'm I'm struggling. I think that's what it's about. But, uh, maybe I'm opaque. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Uh, we had office hours yesterday. We actually went. Ooh, we had we saw a lot of people yesterday. It was very successful. We also had office hours for uh, we also had office hours for the distance learning class yesterday, which was just kind of amazing. You know, it's running parallel to this of having office hours with uh, somebody in Beirut working on the uh, how to bring the two Muslim, uh, conflicting Muslim communities together, or somebody in Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh City who's trying to uh, develop educational capacity uh, there, or somebody in Kenya who's working on genital mutilation issues. <coughs> Just extraordinary. I mean, for me, just an incredibly inspiring experience to have those kinds of interactions. So, office hours are good. So, okay. Uh, so, organizing, as we've uh, been sort of our mantra since the beginning, three kinds of outcomes. Um, there's uh, achieving the goal, uh, you know, changing the law or doing whatever it is. There's building the capacity. That's reconfiguring power in some way that there's a new source of power in terms of organization and organizational capacity. And finally, uh, there's uh, individual growth and learning, leadership development, and that sort of thing. And so we're always thinking about evaluating success in those terms. Uh, we may not achieve the goal, but we may build capacity. Uh, and probably that one is in some ways the most central thing that distinguishes organizing from other kinds of activities because it gets at the power questions that underlie so many of the, of the, of, of the challenges. Um, and now, in doing that, it turns out that if you really think about it, organizations do mainly three things over there. Um, they have meetings. 
um, they take action. And if they're together, they celebrate. Uh, and that tends to be what drops you know, through the cracks too often. Uh, by celebrate, I don't mean the having, having a beer. I, that's fine. But that's not what, what do I mean by celebrate? Am I hiding the ball here? What do I mean by celebrate? <laughs> what am I talking about? Yeah. Yeah, it's feeding the heart. It's sort of recognizing, honoring the values that are that are motivating what's going on, and finding the time to actually focus on that, appreciate it, honor it uh, in each other and, and in the work, along with then the meetings, which are then the strategic part, and then the action, which is the doing part. So again, it's head, hands, heart kind of framework that comes through in what we do in organizations. Now, when you really think about it, how we do these things, uh, the way in which an organization conducts its meetings, the way in which it carries out its action, the way in which it conducts celebrations or doesn't, um, has a lot to do with what we intend, but it has a whole lot to do with, um, how, with, with the kind of structure we create, uh, which is why we're, we're focusing on this today. Um, and and here, here's what I mean by that. How are the resources that the organization draws on uh, actually distributed within the organization? I'm going to come back to it in a second. Uh, how is authority actually managed within the organization? Um, and how is the work actually organized within the organization? Seem to be very key factors in terms of how we do those other things. Now, this may be a little weird because up to this point, we've talked so much about campaigns. But where's the, where's the chart? Oh, yeah, this little thing here. See, campaigns are supposed to actually be creating organizations. And organizations are supposed to be places in which campaigns emerge from or are conducted by. And so there's this dynamic between change and continuity that's at the heart of this. We've talked a whole lot about continuity up to this point, except for our week on structure. Now we're talking more about the tension, like sort of how, how, the two, how the two rhythms interact with each other in organized effort and organized activity. That's, that's what we're trying to focus on. How might the way resources are distributed within an organization affect the way it meets, acts, or celebrates? I, this is very abstract. I want to see if, if you're getting a sense of what I'm talking about. The way in which resources are distributed how would that impact on meetings, on actions, on celebrations? Any thoughts on that? What kind of resources do you draw upon to do work in an organization? Yeah, Mona? I think money, for instance, is one, one resource. And yeah. If it is very con concentrated in one part, then the type of meetings will be kind of listening and obeying and one way of... Uh, you think so? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, does that make sense? See, one thing we tend to really take care of is where our resources come from. I mean, most organizations, groups, really really pay attention to that. Where do our resources come from? Whether it's official or not, whatever our mission says, whatever it is, it's like, where does the lifeblood come from? And what does it consist of? So in Mona's example, you know, maybe one person controls the money. We may be very egalitarian and everything, but we mm, going to take care of that. Do you see what I mean? What if it depends on volunteers? See, what, what if your, your organizational effort depends on volunteer time? Where are you going to put your attention? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're going to really be paying attention to that. You're going to be paying attention to morale, to how people engage, what kind of experiences they have, whether they are motivated to go out and get other people, because your ability to do what you're doing depends on their engagement. And so see, when we were talking that week about, about action and sort of, you know, is it money or people, is it inside, outside, it affects a whole lot the way you structure what you're doing. Like a meeting, having a meeting, let's say that in an organization that depends on volunteer resources, how might that be different than an organization in which it depends on all professional services? How would you structure, how, would, how do you think you design a meeting differently? Yes. Yeah. Well, just in terms of space, you try to, the volunteers try to make it such that it's more convenient while it's actually in the end. Yeah. Take too much of that stuff in the special stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How else? How else might it be different? Yeah. I think another big difference is that with, let's 
say you're meeting with professionals who are paid to be there. Their commitment is already has already been established, and there's sort of exchange that has already happened that brought them to that room. But with volunteers, you kind of have to reestablish or reconnect to whatever commitment brought them yeah. to the meeting in the first place. Very interesting. So you might design it quite differently. Like, oh, come to the chase. Now, of course, it turns out professionals also have hearts, and that their motivation also matters. And you know, sometimes that gets forgotten about. But I mean, I think the point you see the the point I'm trying to make here is that that the resources we draw on actually influences how we do things. And, and, and the second one is about how authority is managed. Like, let's say an organization in which the leadership is elected versus the, you have a board that's a self-appointing board. How might you conduct things differently? In terms of meetings or whatever. Yeah. difference in parties, you're probably going to have a very easy time of creating of creating alternative points of view and getting those aired. Where you have a self-appointed board, it may be they may be less willing to do so. Um, there's more of a, what the group think article tends to talk about. We're just here we're going to move yeah. and keep things moving. Yeah, and of course when it's elected sometimes people do all they can to marginalize any opposition whatsoever. And so then it's a question of, it, it sort of goes, for me, it goes back to the question of, well, where do the resources come from? How tightly are they controlled? How broadly are they accessed? For elections really to be real, there's got to be some resources out there that are at stake. So these things interact. And then this last one is about how work is organized. What about, what, what might that mean? How the work the organization is doing is organized. What bearing might that have on how you meet, act, or celebrate? We, what might we be talking about there? How work is organized. We've got to get our heads back into this. But if we, if we talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I suppose uh, work, and I, work organization has to do with where the responsibility lies. Yeah. Um, and so that's also where celebration will be directed. So um, if, if a task is very uh, vertically stacked, I think is the word for it, um, then you would, I suppose, uh, congratulate units that successfully perform while not necessarily congratulating everyone else who didn't contribute to it. So you, you would have more directed celebration. And that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's an interesting hypothesis, way to think about it. How, how else? Yeah, no, I No, I think that's right. And how interdependent everything is. Whether things are designed that they require interdependence or whether it's a bunch of solo performers out there. It's going to make a big difference in terms of how you conduct meetings, how you celebrate. So the point here is just that paying attention to resources and authority and the organization of work is really foundational in terms of how the organizations really behave. You know, your mission statement, they say all these wonderful things. But if, if it's configured in such a way that it's all about money to hire professionals, well, that's what you're going to take care of. That's what's going to be taken care of. And if it's configured in such a way that it's time contributed by motivated volunteers, that's what you're going to take care of. Not the only thing. And, and so you, you then proceed in different ways. So now... In the, in the readings, the Smith and Berg especially, they talk about dilemmas of structure. And so, so we're, if we're saying structure matters, how you structure things matter in terms of authority and resources and work, then, so what's the challenge? What, what's the issue there? Yeah? Yeah, what I really liked about that reading they talked about this. They're the ones that talk about paradoxes, right? Yeah, right. They we have about paradox the paradox and how a lot of our individual identity is composed of our various group identities. That who we think of as ourselves as individuals depends on what groups we belong to. But on the other hand, when we're a member of that group, being a member in a way negates our identity because we're only partially allowed to express who we are in the 
confines of the group. Okay. And so I think that's really important in, the, in an organizational context because, you know, if everybody's kind of got these different jobs and things and, and someone feels like, well, I don't feel like my work is really being valued or I'm not able to fully express myself in the work that I do or I'm not able to fully participate in decision making at meetings, they're not going to get validation for themselves. Great anymore. point. I, have to, I think that's really good. No, I think that's... And, and do they suggest that you can solve it? No, it's a release. <laughs> this is one, I think this article is one of the best in the course. I, I mean, I really like this article, but I'm sort of a fan of paradox. And I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a certain deal because there's, and, and it's cool what they're saying, because they're not saying, look, there's, a, there's an inherent tension here that has to do with living life, <laughs> and especially being in an organization. And so then, you're not going to get rid of it. How do you manage it? How do you release it? How do you make it constructive? And I think that's, it's a much more helpful way to look at how to deal with these things than to think that, oh, just do this and then all the tension will go away and it'll be resolved. This is not how it works. And so this individual identity versus collective identity that you're describing and sort of the tension, how do we manage that? Not like, how do we reduce it to one or the other? Because reducing it to one or the other, then we lose the power of what we're trying to, trying to build. And that's, I think, what Smith, Smith and Berg, any other comments on Smith and Berg? Just before we get even more specific about this, it's a very, very good reading. It has a, it has a very good sense of reality in organization life, I think. Because th there's three that, that I want to put out there to focus on, three kinds of dilemmas. The one is the inclusion-exclusion question. Like, who's included, who's excluded? It's this question of boundaries. Um, a second one is about continuity and change, as I was mentioned before. Like, how do you structure things so that you assure continuity, but then how do you do it in such a way that it doesn't stop change? Or on the other hand, how do you structure things to achieve change in a way that allows you to also create some continuity, which is kind of... And then the third one, um, that uh, in particular, is about unity and diversity, um, about... Um, you know, we've got to have enough unity to do what we're trying to do. But then we, then we wind up with groupthink, maybe. But if we're all over the place, then we may great, make great decisions, but we can't act on them because we're too disunited. So these three tensions, I think, are interesting ones. Um, who's run into those sorts of things? Any of those three, inclusion, exclusion, continuity, change, unity, diversity, who's, who's who struggle with those in, in their projects or in or in other settings? I want to take a little bit of time with this, and then we're going to get to some suggestions about how to manage it. Yeah, Mick. <coughs> I've never really worked out when you have like you want to have a bounded group as your leadership team, right? Because yeah. you have to have you know a stability of people, and you can't have twelve people making decisions, or it's going to be like a messy meeting. Yeah. I've always struggled with. When your organization grows because you're starting to, you know, do well, and new people want to get really deeply involved, how do you manage that? Like, how do you how do you add or remove people from a leadership group, or like, you know, once it's started? Because there might be some very good reasons why you want to do that, but you're you're off, you're running, and that's your team. So what do you do now? <coughs> yeah, good question. Who's got the answer? No, really, I would. No, it's a great question. <laughs> I mean, it goes both on unboundedness and it also goes on continuity and change, right? Now, we want to have the same people no matter what, except for there are certain issues <laughs> that may come up. No, what, what are your thoughts about that? Is he the only one to have to struggle with that? Yeah, Pat? Depending, I would say, on the project and where you're going, people actually will remove themselves because it's not going, you know, how they want it to go and then and they remove themselves. I have had that experience. You're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> what about when they don't? Yeah, Eric? Well, I guess maybe then the paradigm I was thinking about with that challenge is around like formal and informal leadership. And like how is it that um, you know, people who want to be part of it or as you're growing, is there a structure or opportunities in place for people to express leadership informally? There might be these formal titles, so-and-so is the deputy director, blah, blah, blah. But like, if you're only locked into those formal titles, then that maybe is a bigger organizational question of how do you express the leadership. Other thoughts? 
Now, I think, I mean, to that I was going to say that a lot of it may be circumstantial. So, for example, like who the people that will be able to like become leaders in like the next, I don't know, phase of the project. It, it may depend on, like you said, like where the project is going, but will they actually be there next year and, and things like that. And also, I think that sometimes they, like the people that, you know, are, sometimes you're not sure if people will have that commitment or not, so you need to find the mechanisms in the project or whatever it is you're doing to like build that commitment. What are you thinking about? So for example, I mean, and we discussed this, but in, the, in my project, I think a, a good way to actually build the leadership team for next year will be in the actual conference to actually have them, you know, come forward on, on like on the day of the event and have everybody, you know, like applaud them and congratulate them for like taking on the leadership role for next year. Um, and also maybe securing mechanisms, so maybe like if we have enough money this year with a conference, instead of like spending that in, you know, like last minute pieces or whatever, actually building a fund for next year, so they actually know that there there's some money there oh. and tying it in. Like, so you're thinking about how to transition leadership mindfully, mm -hmm. how to move to the next group. Mm -hmm. uh, with that assumes that the first group is ready to let up let go, or needs to, right? Which in mixed case may not totally have been the case sometimes, but Mary? I was going to add on to what Patricia had said to you. Sometimes they may leave on their own, and sometimes you can help that along with an with offline <laughs> conversations. Are you happy, are you frustrated? Um, and if they can say that I am, they may leave. And it may not be you who has that conversation, it may be some other member of the leadership team who has a better relationship with them, but also recognizes that they might be happier working on something else. I, I heard a thing on NBR the other day about this guy who's a professional breaker upper. <laughs> and, 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 and you get a hold of this guy, and, and he will go break up with whoever for you. And uh, it's amazing. I mean, he has a whole business, you know. It's like, oh, that, it, that's, yeah. So that, oh, can I, your services, please. Yeah, please. Uh, For the formal structures of authority or like a leadership team, they essentially created a structure where two people were holding the position at the same time, but one moves out earlier. So like if it's like a year or two years or whatever the time frame is for the action or that orientation, two people hold it and one person moves on earlier, leaving a space for somebody else to come in, but requiring collaboration. And the way she was able to do it is she kept having conversations around like legacy. Like, oh, how are we building the legacy? Um, and so it, like people who are really passionate about it who might not be willing to step out as easily were like, oh, this is a way I can contribute in an even bigger fashion. Oh. Now, I want to come, we're going to come back to this in a few minutes. I, I just want to get these other two out there. Uh, so this thing about inclusion, exclusion, how do we bound in, how do we bound out is a, is a pretty critical kind of question for some of the reasons that have been raised. What about continuity and change? I struggle with that one. I mean, in a way, it's related a little bit to the next question, too. These are not exclusive, you know, mutually exclusive categories, but we're, who's had to struggle with, with continuity, change, tension, or what that even means? Yeah. I think this might be continuing on a little bit, um, and I think there are other people that might have this, is that I am starting a leadership team and then extracting myself from it, um, which is going to be a huge continuity and change break. What else? What are some other thoughts about continuity, change, tensions? People are running into continuity and change. What do you want to assure? Like, like if you think we're setting up a group, we're setting an organization up. You want to assure continuity of experience, right? Of leadership. Do you? Forever? I mean, uh, at what point? does it become counterproductive? At what point does an organization need fresh leadership, need fresh perspectives, need to change to remain relevant to the world that's around it? I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of like, you know, yeah, if it's like this, then you're never building anything. But if it's otherwise, it can be like a stone. The world changes and nothing within does. 
you've had experience with this sort of thing, no? I mean, it's, and so there's a really interesting, interesting question there. Because unless you're able to keep relevant to the environment around you, you begin to diverge from it, and you become less effective as an organization. On the other hand, unless you develop experience and understanding and skill and practice, then you never get to be. So it's like, where's the shift there? I want to put that there. Yeah, Julian. Um, two things that come to mind. Uh, first is the recommendation of many one of the articles about having sort of external, um, like making a culture where you have people who are external to your leadership team sort of observe and sort of provide feedback that you're not able to see yep. internally. And so the first thing is like making a culture of that. And I think the second thing that comes to mind is um, kind of to the point made earlier, just like making a space where we can continually have that conversation about where we're going, about sort of what um, sort of changes might Yep. And tough stuff. Very hard uh, to assure honesty and frankness in intra-organizational discussions where position and power and so forth is at stake. Oh, so easy. Yeah. Uh, in my organization where I was brought in as somebody who came with a fresh set of skills, I, my boss gave me the onus of getting other older people to get them on board with the new so I thought Interesting. she did not keep it with herself. Yeah. She passed it on to me and somebody else who had come along with me. Interesting. It's an interesting, an interesting strategy. How did, the, how did the older folks receive that? So now when they cribbed, they cribbed about the boss, but they worked with us. So they, they did not like the new way, but yeah. then because we were in the same position as they were, they found us to be allies and easier to come to help. Then, yeah. and how did the boss respond to this? She took the burden of whatever uh, huh. was happening. It's interesting. I mean, it is interesting there that there, uh, somebody appreciating the fact that there was going to be tension, and that was going to be part of the deal, and not to try to just insulate herself from it, but rather try to design it in such a way it could be productive. I mean, that's interesting. But you don't see that very often. I mean, usually it's like, ooh, you know. It's all about like trying to protect and so forth. That's 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 pretty interesting. What about this last one about unity and diversity? And again, these are not entirely. I mean, there's a lot of interrelation, but you know, what about the tension of unity and diversity? Lots of different opinions. No, we're all united. Anybody have to deal with that one? Yeah. What? You're nodding your head. And in the conflict with strategizing, I think is I think the most um, difficult to incorporate in the diversity. Well, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, but I think that it goes back to um, always getting back to the purpose, getting back to the purpose, and how the strategies are connected to the purpose, and 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 um, trying to. Um, Keep that in, in the mind of everyone in the team. Yeah. So I think. Um, so in other words, you try to re, you try to recall the common purpose mm -hmm. as a ground within which to have the diversity of debate. Yes, and, and what we will do or, or not do. It's good if you can do that. It's very good. It's good if you can do that. Other thoughts on this one? Yeah, Kevin. Um, I, I wonder what sort of decision making mechanisms are best for filtering diversity um, into unity later on, because I think the, the key distinction the reading makes is between deciding what to do and actually doing it right. So you, you need to find a decision-making mechanism that gets everyone behind actually doing it while letting the dissent occur when you're deciding what to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure what mechanism that is, actually. No, I mean, it, no, it's how you kind of visualize like the difference between debating, deciding whether or not to take the hill, right? Let's have lots of discussion. And then, no, we've now we've decided to take the hill. We're all doing this together. Uh, making that switch uh, can be really difficult. Sometimes consensus decision making is an effort to try to avoid having to deal with it. In other words, well, we're, all, we're just going to talk and talk and talk until we all agree. So then, of course, we'll all agree on implementation, as opposed to 
no, we're going to accept that we have difference in terms of how to do this, but we're still going to have unity on implementation. Even though we disagree, a majority, minority, something like that. Organizations face that kind of tension all the time. And sort of, how do you, when you make an agreement, when is it really an agreement, even if you disagree with it? Because if, if it spills over into implementation, well, then you're undermining the decision that was just made. And, and that's tough. I mean, because, you know, the world, there are places for consensus, and there are places where it just simply is not, doesn't, doesn't, it's not operative. And so this is not a class on answers today, by the way. But I mean, I, I want to put these out there because there, there are some thoughts about how to engage these that I'd like to, to share. And then let's talk about how they could actually play out. One of the ones that, that in organizing world that I've found that's really helpful. Just thinking about no more continuity. <laughs> no more battery. I'll try to be loud. Uh, okay. Am I being sufficiently loud? Yeah. You hear me in the back? All right. Um, this first one is thinking about. Okay, so, and this goes uh, uh, again to the first point. How can you push responsibility out or down? In other words, um, one of the challenges is allowing responsibility to become highly concentrated. <coughs> if you think about how do you design things so that you're pushing responsibility out and de down may be the wrong metaphor if you're thinking hierarchically or out if you want to think, you know, horizontally or whatever. But it's sort of the opposite of allowing all the responsibility to concentrate <coughs> in one place. What, what would be an example of that? How, how would you design that? See, like, take mixed examples. It's got a leadership team. They're there. There's more people that want to play a role. How could you respond to that organization structurally? How would you respond to it? involved in the care of a patient, and one of the ways of doing that is having um, very different roles for a lot of different people, whether those are senior doctors, junior doctors, <coughs> students, nurses, medical assistants, techs, you know, involving a whole range of different skills, but all of these people have a responsibility for in the care of one patient. Um, so one way could be having very diverse roles that takes advantage of many different skills and perspectives. No, that's really uh, an interesting, uh, interesting thought. And it goes to one other point here. Oops. Can you hear it? Oh, on now? Yeah. No, I, I mean, responsibility is being more broadly distributed, but also, what else is being more broadly distributed? I don't, I don't mean to play. You're creating a, an interdependent work situation. So you see, in other words, Organizing the work in such a way that responsibility is distributed um, is a way of organizing the work. It's also a way of, of, of sharing responsibility, <coughs> of, of creating more opportunities for certain kinds of leadership. So these things kind of, I mean, what, what's another like, yeah? But I think, well, if we apply to, to a project that way, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that that happens in medicine, but I think that one thing that we would have to be careful would be with that duplicity of effort. Okay. Because so there's efficiency issues. Because if you, if you want to just create a lot of roles, and so everyone can be involved in one responsibility or like two responsibilities, well, and so they can feel useful, I don't think that is efficient. Okay. So then what's a response to that? <coughs> yeah. Uh, I think one thing that organizations normally would do is to create centers of excellence or locational centers of excellence. So somebody who wants to be in a responsibility role gets a specialty. Uh, so if they are experts in designing curriculum, they become the center of excellence. Okay, that's an interesting way to think about it. I mean, you know, just in, in, uh, in electoral campaigns, it's a question of um, if you create, see, it's, if you think about something like a get out the vote operation. Now, this is where the whole goal is to get out the vote on election day 
which means you harass, no, it means you <laughs> motivate people uh, very intensely until it's clear that they've, that they've voted. And now one, one way to do that uh, is you have a central operation that's phoning and emailing, and they've got a list, and they're just operating on that thing, and that's what they're doing. Another way to think of it is that you have in each precinct a voting unit. You have a team who are responsible for that. And then their job becomes to focus on their set of people, on their polling place, on their phone calls, or their house visits, or whatever it is. Now, in that second form, you have a lot less direct control. So you have to let go of some direct control. On the other hand, you're distributing responsibility really widely. Now, I mean, I was raised in the tradition of that's what you do. <laughs> Because that's how you actually get ownership way out there at the place it matters rather than having this central operation with everybody just running like a machine. What it does then is create leadership opportunities at all levels. And you then begin to see who surfaces and, and who shines and who doesn't. And, and then your focus is much more as a coach and supporter. You, you're, there's accountability and transparency, but then there's also support and training. But it's a different way of thinking about it. Probably less efficient in terms of the time it takes up front. But in, what are you trying to actually do? Are you trying to, you know, are you trying to, um, you know, create an experience that really does empower, that creates more power? I mean, this was the choice in, in, in Obama 2007-8, was to really focus on those teams at the base level, rather than just try to do it all out of one spot. And so, so, I, you know, how you then structure responsibility, distribute it, uh, organize it into chunks, uh, has a lot to do with this, you know, this inclusion-exclusion. And also unity and diversity, right? And it's all one little group if you have opportunities for leadership that are much more widely distributed. So this isn't just kind of theoretical. It's really like, it goes to how you're, how you're designing the work. Another one is about collaboration, and, and Julia brought up the example about, um, about interdependence. If you think about how to maximize opportunities for collaborative work in an organization, as opposed to minimizing them, what do you get? What are the benefits you get from that? In terms of, you know, change of continuity, unity, diversity, inclusion, exclusion. What's the role of designing things interdependently? I mean. It was interesting because we had efficiency issue over here, but then we had inclusion. What are the benefits of collaborative design? Oh, well, we know there's the challenges with it, but what are the benefits? Who's been part of successful collaborations? Anybody collaborated successfully with anybody? Like anything? I hope so. Uh huh. And what are the benefits? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you get you get a kind of high, higher motivation, you know. Yeah, you're in a constant sort of developmental kind of mode. What else? Yeah. <laughs> Don't have to carry the burden of so much work. Amen to that. Right? Yeah, yeah. Start getting used to doing work in the Yeah, breaking out of the dot. You know, you're getting out of the dot, the dot thing, right? Are you taking more advantage of the resources you have available in the organization? Yeah, because you're creating these kinds of opportunities. So then why don't we see more of it, do you think? Uh, maybe we see a lot of it. I actually think we're seeing more of it than we used to see. I actually think it's the direction things are going in, very much so. You know, because for a lot of, but, but yeah, Kevin, you have, yeah. Uh, I think that's because there's a bit of a trade-off here between collaboration and accountability. Um, and the more you collaborate, the more the harder it is to hold a single person accountable, right? And so maybe the recent trend towards uh, more collaboration is because it's easier to hold people accountable for smaller pieces of work, uh, because we, we know more data uh, about the outputs and whatever. Uh, Possibly, I, I don't know. It's no, it's an interesting theory. I mean, another theory would be that there's so much more complexity and diversity out there mm -hmm. that you need a wider range of capacity in order to deal with things. Yeah, Arjun, you I think also uh, the dot initially feels safer. 
because you kind of are in control of uh, the information and the interpretation. Yeah. And once uh, you have the leadership risk model, things are happening at the edges. Very often you may not even know it at the, at the center. And you have to just take it as, as it uh, flows. Uh, the second thing on your yeah. point of uh, believing that the leadership is, is getting more to the edges, I think the internet naturally is also a fundamental tool that is shifting it more like into the web. Yeah. And so it's forcing people to do things, uh, you know, often not even, uh, you know, in smaller groups and very distributed, yet being able to collaborate because the tools are so much, uh, uh, so oriented towards collaboration. No, I think it's, we're in a new world of possibility. I think it's really, really true. Um, but then again, it always comes back to human beings. It's the the the, bike, the rider of the bike there that's missing in the, in the bike there, too. I'm, what's it, how, what in your experience dealing with that more peripheral thing? What, how do you deal with that? You know, where 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 you you were saying like um, the dot is safer, yeah. and so ooh, I want the dot, but yeah, but so how do you manage that? I mean, you've had to deal with this, right? Well, I think it's scary one, and I think you're you're taking responsibility for other people's work, so to speak, yeah. or at least for the end, end result. I think you have to trust the process a lot more, mm -hmm. and you have to uh, you have to be a certain scale when it really works. A certain scale? How do you mean? Well, I think you know it, there's only so much a dot can do. How many relationships are you going to manage it at any single time? Well, it's amazing though how much we try. <laughs> 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 So, that's, that's, so I think the, the minute it goes past that critical mass, yeah. you either work yourself into a frenzy or pretty much into the ground, you yeah. kind of burn out, uh, or you start realizing, I have to get help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when you take baby steps, you just kind of uh, improve it. So this thing about collaboration, and then what, so then, you know, what does it suggest like in terms of accountability in an organization? I mean, if, if the way the organization, if the way the organizing effort gets done requires everybody's collaboration, um, how easy is it then to just focus on the needs of one or two people? Pretty hard. It means you, you put your attention where you need to put it in order to get the result you're trying to get. You, you see what I'm saying? In other words, how you structure these things has a whole lot to do with where you pay attention, what you take care of, what the resource is, how the work is organized, where the authority is. I mean, there's a third one. So, so collaboration can be a way to manage some of these tensions because it's more interdependent, it's more inclusive, it's more contingent, it's inherently more diverse. Uh, it has to do with, with boundaries are sort of structured a bit differently. Even though there's boundaries, it's a little differently. What about, uh, there's a third one, which is, uh, I think, in, in civic organizations, really important, which is about uh, dissent. And how dissent is managed. I don't mean this is dissent is not disloyalty. <laughs> the perception that any dissent is disloyalty, and the reaction to that. Who, who's been in a setting where dissent has really been well managed? You know, not where it turns into warfare or half a group leaving, but like where it's really well managed. Anybody have good experience like that? Yeah, Eric, how how it work? Well, I think in civic organizations, what I've seen it work, or been a part of it, is when the meeting of the organization is viewed as an action in and of itself, not just a preparation for the upcoming action. So say it's for an election, right? When you have the team meeting, there is work and planning that goes into that team meeting. Uh -huh. so, and it's those, so it's like, hey, just so you know, at this meeting, we're going to propose X, Y, and Z. What do you think? Oh, I'm not sure I agree with that. So you already have that knowledge and, and work going into it. You've approached it like you have a public action, Good. and turn, not through manipulation or you know behind the scenes work, but really through like preparing an agenda and feeling it out with everyone that's going to be involved. It's really interesting, and it lifts up this thing about uh, Meet, Act, Celebrate. Really recognizing the centrality of meetings in the life of organized effort. I mean, everybody complains about meetings. I think it's, I think it's largely because. We do such a poor job of it so much of the time. But when you think about it, how else do organizations get to work then? I mean, make decisions, actually be, you know, consider things. And uh, Eric's point about like really getting what's going on there. 
and really thinking about it and creating the kind of experience that's just so, so smart and so rarely really done. Oh, let's just have a you know, meeting. It's, it's, it's really something, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. How, what, what else about this, this sense thing? Yeah. Critical friend, you hear that now a lot more. Our critical friend, because we're, we seem to be getting more aware of how much we wind up staying fish in the water of our own reality, whatever it happens to be. And this need for a different set of eyes that's going to ask questions and probe and do the sort of things we do with the track changes in your paper. No, I, we, you know, we are friendly and critical. I hope you understand. But I mean, no, it's a, it's an interesting uh, deal. What, what else? This whole descent thing. Yeah. I had an experience where I was building the sculpture park in Jamaica, and my colleague, who was we're sharing offices, did not believe it could be done. And her energy kept pulling in. And then I went to the president of the university where the sculpture park was going to be situated, and I asked if I could operate from home. And you know, I would do the same amount of work, knew exactly where to find it. And so that I could create a descent, I went home, I operated from home, he allowed me to do the work from home. So that was how I was able to more or less not be with her descent all years with me. Mm -hmm. and, and pulling and saying it could not be done, it was not possible. But now was that descent or was that um, Eeyore? I mean was that <laughs> was that descent or was that like you know, there are people that are always finding fault. Is that the same thing as dissent? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's important to distinguish because we may both have a very positive interest in commitment. We just see it differently. We just see it differently. And, and creating a space where it can be seen differently with respect and, and not taken as awful, really challenging, but really important. Why you see it differently? I mean, yeah. a basic reason to say, well, this is why I see it differently. It cannot, and then if you don't have a reason, then I just think you're the same. Yeah, you know. you're just being different, just to be in yeah, order. Yes, no, no. Well, so then, what does that mean then about how how to express difference matters? I mean, then it suggests, oh, why do you feel that way? Yes. Ask for more information. See, see the, and, and so if the difference goes to an exploration of the sources of difference rather than a reaction to difference, then it's likely to be much more constructive. But you know, sometimes when we see difference coming up in a debate, we sort of dodge it rather than sort of saying, okay, I'm hearing this and I'm hearing this. Okay, who's going to make the case for this? Who's going to make the case for this? Sometimes we sort of want to just mush over it and say, well, it's not really different, you know. And then we just lost the benefit of actually learning from the kind of, of um, uh, new information that can come from a real exploration of the sources of difference. Because people may have different life experience. They may be reasoning about it differently. They, they, they may be looking at it in a different framework, and that's something to benefit from. If there's then a way to come to agreement about action. I think that's kind of where the where the trick is here. But boy, sometimes we have to have this visceral reaction to difference. It's really, really problematic. Yeah? So when you first um, posed this question about um, when do we see the set management, yeah. one of the ways that you just sort of in passing mentioned that wouldn't be that as well would be if a bunch of people left. So I'm wondering if um, with all the way that we've been talking about managing the set well, are you saying that at some point um, with the community organization based on some of the readings that we've looked at with the theme of inclusion versus exclusion, wouldn't you then have to, at some point, exclude a group of people? Wouldn't, isn't managing it well, doesn't it inevitably include people leaving if they don't agree with, with some of the sort of core tenets 
tenets or strategies that your organization has decided on. I'm thinking back to, um, we looked at the civil rights movement a lot and earlier in the course. Now, um, I'm a big fan of Malcolm X, but in his earlier rhetoric, a lot of what he spoke about was, you know, not necessarily nonviolence, but sometimes you have to take up arms to defend your rights or your community. And he wasn't at that time part of the same uh, uh, leaders who were working with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and more uh, civil disobedience yeah. kind of strategy. Yeah. So at some point, you would have to say to Malcolm X, that's great, um, but the way that we've just defined our group is with you outside of the way that, you know, we self-identify, right? We define you outside the circle. And like, in order for the civil rights movement to be successful, you couldn't include people who want to beat up racists. So, so without getting into the Malcolm Dr. King <laughs> challenge, no, no, which is a very, it's actually a really interesting uh, dialogue. The, the whole dialogue, the whole thing, is, there's a lot to learn from that. What about that? What about her point? Well, uh, how do you, how do you, how do you think about that? How, how do you think about that constructively? You know, because you, you, you need to take a position. Anybody disagrees? Out. out. So how do you think about it constructively? Yeah, Jeff and then Eric. Our experience was with Myers-Briggs and the 16 types of personalities. What we found was that uh, there's, there was a predominant type in our group. And once they were explained the reasoning for the change, then, and, then, and they accepted that, then they were fully supportive of the change. Okay. And so we think it calls out the need for leaders to know where they want to go with the organization. Yeah. And why? Okay. And to be able to explain that to those that are going to stay in the group. Well, so there is this question of where are we going and why and how are we trying to do it. But Eric, what did you? I mean, I just I mean, what most basically it comes back to the, the, that power importance of the shared purpose exercise, and that it can't just be done on the first day, especially as the group grows or <coughs> cycling back to that. And, you know, if, if someone's saying, "Well, we need to take up arms," it's like, "Well, let's go look at our shared purpose." <laughs> Nonviolence is in our shared purpose, so. You know, it's not about excluding you, it's that we've gone through these exercises yeah. and conversations and relationships to build that. No, I think it's really, really helpful. But but it's a judgment. You know, so clearly, <coughs> there, unless there's enough commonality of values, purpose, and so forth, for there to be a common project, you're not going to have it. On the other hand, it's not everything. And so then there are boundaries. But then, there, so, so one issue is sort of these big boundaries, right, like that. But then there's this other issue within, we all agree on our common purpose, but I think we should do it this way, and you think you should do it that way. Get out of the organization. That's problematic, I think. See, where we, we have an agreement about what our purpose is, but we have very different notions about how to pursue it strategically. And unless we can tolerate that and handle that and learn from it, then we're going to make a narrower, 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 narrower group. And so being able to create that, find that the sweet spot, the balance there, I think is really one of the hardest things and really important. Yeah? I think that's, uh, for me, one of the, the important things that came out of the Big Thinker article, which is being able to, as important as setting down those original unity, unifying purpose and norm, <coughs> being able to circle back every now and then when you do a large group of dissent that wants to change and say, let's, let's circle back and think about were, were those the correct, was that the correct purpose originally? As we've seen how things have worked out, do we need to rethink our purpose? Do we need to, need to rethink our strategy? Because sometimes the original one may not be working within the environment that you're at. I that came through with the, with the Vietnamese War um, examples that we used with that. Yeah, and it may be that, that there need to be two organizations instead of one. It may be that that's what's developed. So, so I think. But, but this, so then, what's what's sort of the, the key to this? I, I mean, I, again, I want to do hide the ball here, but thinking proactively. In other words, if you sort of exp, you, you know, when you talk about a very regular circling circling back, there's there's a, a regular way in which we're going to examine our core and what we're up to, and we call it our convention or our annual whatever, and we're going to check in about that. And, and then, in the meantime, we're going to have these strategic things. And then we're going to go back and look at the basics again. I, in other words, much of this, if, if you're thinking proactively, and you create the space for it, then you're not caught reacting to it, 
when it happens in the middle of some crisis moment, and then the organization splits and everybody hates everybody, and you know, warfare ensues. You know, which it can. I mean, because there are important times to break. I mean, cultural shifts. You know, religious shifts. I mean, tradition doesn't die. It, it changes. It, it, people learn, change, grow. So uh, this is tough stuff. I mean, this is not an easy answer. I just mindfulness about it, not being frightened of it, and sort of recognizing the kind of natural character of it. I think is really, really helpful and, and, and important. Uh, and, and and these are these are some some good suggestions here. I, I mean, just. Looking back at these three things, meeting, acting, and celebrating, you know, then we've been talking about some of the methods here. I just want to amplify a little bit. How to, how to manage these dilemmas in ways in which we celebrate, for example. Like, you know, these, these dilemmas of who's in, who's out, of change, continuity, and so forth, difference, not. How would you bring that into celebrating? <laughs> I was thinking about it. How would you bring it into celebrating? Who's been in a great organizational celebration? I, I want to see how much experience we actually have. With Come on. People ever been to a religious service of any kind? This, I mean, that's essentially what most are. I mean, there's celebrations of values and of culture and tradition. Uh, and uh, not only religious, but I mean, there's a lot of different settings in which anybody ever been to a uh, Red Sox game? I mean, come on. I mean, this is like, I mean, you know, um, World Cup, uh, no. All these cultural activities that are essentially celebrations of shared values. I mean, that's a lot of what's going on around us. So think about it in an organizational context. What are some ways you can kind of honor some of these things in the way you would design a celebration for your organization, your project, your group? We need some party planners here. Come on. Celebratory ideas. What? Awards. You certainly could. <laughs> well, you give award to, to the one person who gave the most money. That's not what you had in mind. <laughs> what you have in mind. The people who really, you know, have contributed and helped to make yeah. action to give awards. Yeah, it's really, you know, and it can be done as a sort of just trivial thing, or it can be done in a real way, as a real form of recognition, and, and have it be real and meaningful. And, and it's, it's beneficial to that. Yeah, I, back over there, somebody was, saw uh, life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I always like when there's different people get to speak. If you've got like 100 people in a room saying, yeah, we won one thing, then having you know, people from different corners yeah. of your group or movement each saying, you know, what they got involved in and who else they're grateful to. It can be like a really cohesive thing. It can be very, and it can lift up the difference. It can acknowledge the shared responsibility. See, little things, but they have big meaning if you really pay attention and think about it. What else are like celebratory? Yeah. Yeah, tell me about food. Yeah. Being a Yeah, just think about a potluck. I mean, a potluck, like, it's interdependent, right? It's interdependent. It's diverse, usually. You wind up with very different kinds of things. It's collaborative. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a little potluck, you know? And, and, and so how to, how to capture the power of these things? What else? Other kind of celebratory ideas. Yeah, what? Well, I think also it's a, a time for uh, a first affirming the narrative that was created and brought people in and, and uh, affirm it, uh, celebrate it, uh, and, uh, and uh, recognize that that was the, the, the core, maybe mostly the narrative of us that, uh, that brought people together. So that would be the continuity part versus yeah. the diversity of the potluck and the thing. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you the narrative is the continuity, but then how could you bring change into the narrative? Right? It's a new chapter. Right? Tonight we're writing the next chapter. 
So we're honoring the past in our contribution to it. And so you don't get stuck over here. You don't forget about over here, you're over here. You're sort of honoring the shift and the continuity at the same time. This, I mean, this is really an important point. And then whose voices articulate the narrative? One person? And this is mixed point about, oh, you have different points sharing the narrative. Oh, then it's a, it's a shared narrative. This isn't just like we're listening to one authoritative account. These little things, they, they really communicate a lot. They, they build in a lot of different ways of people experiencing this. Yeah? Um, just two other ideas. One, uh, just like a, maybe like a video, to sort of capture sort of what's been done and sort of the advancement through visual. And I think the second thing would be, even something as simple as like having your campaign sort of peaks and sort of as you're going through sort of like, you know, a visual acknowledgement of like where, where we've gotten so far, so yep. Yep, and a picture there of the people who did this and who did that. Yeah. Yeah, on the distance learning class at the end, each section does a video um, sort of that reflects all the different countries that people are in. And they did a video last year that, what was the song about? Um, oh, it ends with maybe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was a version of that that just went from language to language around the world, and it, but that was the sort of unifying theme, and it was a riot. It was really it was great because it was sort of yeah, but different. Yeah, but maybe. <laughs> so, it's very cool. So look, we can be really creative about this stuff, and I think it's bringing a creative spirit to it is is what you want to do, and that's what the spirit of celebration is is really about. Uh, yeah, Mary, did you have a question? One of the things that we talked about in public narrative class last semester was addressing times when we lose, when oh. things don't go wrong. And I was wondering if the celebrate yeah. encompasses addressing those Hugely. times, too. Probably most important. Probably more important to celebrate at times of loss than win. Because that's when people really need the heart fuel. Not in terms of like, oh, it's everything's okay but in terms of actually confronting the experience of loss and, and, and the failure, and then finding the resources in each other for the resilience to move forward. Now, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, the worst thing is when people do a whole campaign and they lose, and then that's it, bye. Nobody processes anything, nobody takes anything from it, it's all left inside here, people feel awful. You've had this kind of thing, no? It's just terrible. When what you want to do is just the opposite. You want to engage it. And, and, but not in a form of denial, but in a form of, yeah, it really hurts. But now let's deal with that. And let's figure out how we get the moral resources to come through it. That's in, that, in public narrative, we do this week on stories of loss, like dealing with loss. And it's, it's one of the most important things. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Yeah? It just made me think about uh, Iowa in 2004. Of course, everybody remembers the Howard Dean scream that you know his campaign was probably already doomed at that point anyway. But, but what was Not interesting quite. to me about that? <laughs> Sorry. No, that's um, <laughs> <laughs> Was that uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards came on as if he had won the election? Uh, uh, he had finished like a close second to yeah. Gary or something, yeah. and he comes on just all like this and like. And, and it's just like, the whole room is like electrified by him and stuff. And Kerry actually um, started his speech in the middle of, of Edward's acceptance speech because he was afraid. That he was going to take his yeah. energy. Of course, that turned out to have some issues with it, too. And, you know, Mr. Edwards right. to have some, some concerns there. But, no, but, but, um, no, but I think this thing of handling loss, um, there's a, it's, a, it's a very... Um, those are moments, actually, I think, in the life of campaigns and organizations where you really see whether this thing's going to be around or not. That's where you really see the moral, the moral fiber of the leadership and the people and how they deal with it. Because um, it's, um, yeah, it's real. And the thing about it is, in our personal lives, we have to learn to do it a lot. We have to deal with it, you know, all of us at various points in life. But we somehow forget that that can be a resource for how to deal with it in public because it's, a, it's sort of the same set of, of capacity that's required to deal with it in public. I really appreciate bringing that up. Well, we talked a little bit less about, we talked about meetings a bit, um, action perhaps a little less so, but, but I think this conversation about celebration hopefully brings out 
how in small ways, all the time, you're either sort of managing these things or not. And the point is being, being mindful, appreciating the, the tensions, and understanding that the tensions are sources of real energy. <laughs> They're sources of real creativity. If you, if you take the tension out, then it dies. <laughs> so let's do some takeaways here. Okay. About four minutes left. Three minutes. What are some takeaways from today's conversation? Any takeaways? Celebrating loss. <coughs> Come to my loss party. <laughs> what else? What else? That is what a lot of religious worship is about, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I think the discussion around paradoxes and like seeing them as answers to things that you're Good. What else? What do you take away from today? Yeah. I really like the idea about appointing a devil's advocate, no many. That's cool. Devil's advocate, critical friend, official dissenter. Yeah. What else? Yeah. I thought we left that it's good that we practice dissent and celebration in private when we have a private session in public. And so making it a personal discipline to, to I don't know, dissent yourself. I don't know about that. Dissent <laughs> and to celebrate. Yeah. yeah. What else? That was really, that was very helpful. Thank you for putting that on the agenda, because that's a, that's a real important uh, dimension. What else? The shared purpose. So uh, that's your ground you go back to, and are we still with this? Do we need to change? Do we need to go our separate ways, or whatever it is? You know, it's kind of very, very good. What else? What else? What, uh, what facilitated your learning today? What was useful for your learning today? The pluses and deltas. Yeah. I think more near the end, I think you really try to push us to think about how we do these things within our projects. Yeah. Particularly with the celebration piece. So I thought that was. And the delta would be more of that. Yeah. <laughs> right, that's good. What else? What else was so interesting learning today? Yeah. No, we're going to have a lot more of that coming up. A lot more of that. Because the stuff we're going to be talking about each week is a lot more relevant and centered to, I think, to the kinds of experience that you're having. What else? Pluses, deltas, yeah. I personally found that sitting closer to the front helped my learning. And I say that uh -huh. in most of some of my other classes. Oh, <laughs> ah, good for yes. Yeah, that's also, it's a lot. It, 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 it works for me a whole lot better, too, because you're actually seeing people. They're not like, hey, we're over there. No, yeah, thank you for that. It's good. What else? Eric? Um, I appreciated uh, there was in, like, wait time, just with the answer, because there, was, there wasn't the height of the ball. I, 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 I hadn't thought of that before, but it was just, I was then thinking through things without thinking I had to get a right answer. It was good. Like, the process and share once there was time. That's great. Very, very good. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning of the class, when you gave us feedback on our papers and also on how you know we evaluated the class, it was really helpful. Good. No, it's very good. Yeah. Um, I like how you made us answer each other in terms of, yeah. so, so it wasn't you hiding the ball and us trying to find the ball. Yes. <laughs> Passing the ball, it's soccer. Passing the ball, exactly. It's, it's soccer exactly. instead of ping pong, you know, this is Sorry. a much better deal. All right, good. Well, look, uh, let's have a good second half of the semester here. Yeah, thank you. Can I make an announcement? I know I waited at the wrong end of the lecture. Yeah. Um, but speaking of celebrations of shared values, <laughs> this Thursday at 4 p.m., uh, a group of Harvard students are going to get together and go and join a rally for the Double Tree workers. So for those who haven't heard about my project, Harvard owns a hotel which badly mistreats its workers. They're working in unsafe conditions, very low pay, um, and worst of all, the hotel's sort of taking aggressive union busting tactics. Um, so a group of us are getting together uh, outside here at 4 p.m., outside the main entrance to this building. We're all going to be wearing Harvard gear. Um, because it'll really mean the world to these workers to know that students at this institution actually care about them, and it might just mean something to Harvard University admin as well. So if you'd like to join us, 4 p.m., 
outside the front of JFK building, the main entrance, we'll leave at 415 and wear every hearted thing you've got. <laughs> so you can pink, you can act, and you can celebrate all at the same time. Have a good week.